Psychoanalysis began to fall out of favour in the 1970s and then in the 1980s we had what you might call the cognitive revolution where a model of the mind that depicted it as a, uh, analogous to a computer and information processor began to dominate as we move into the 90s uh, and, and to the present day cognitive psychology, cognitive neuroscience dominates these domains and I would still maintain uh, they are giving us a, a, a depleted account of the human psyche by not accounting for what psychoanalysis would call the unconscious mind and, and most people know as the subconscious mind because at the moment it, it, it sits in a space where uh, scientists don't believe that it's been proven they um, they charge this approach with being a belief system that you have to make a, a leap of faith to believe that the unconscious mind exists um, and that repression exists and to me it's self-evident um, but uh, but even you know e even reading psychoanalysis it's quite hard to really appreciate the depth of the human psyche without experiencing a, a, an altered state or at least reading about it, you know, or witnessing it in some form. So psychoanalysis has dreams, dream interpretation, slips of the tongue and bungled actions. But is that all we've got really to verify the existence of the unconscious mind? Um, and then I, I, I looked into it and discovered Stan Groff's work um, and it was there in the very title of one of his books, Realms of the Human Unconscious, uh, uh, Studies with LSD. Um, I just de devoured that book um, and it was a huge um, eye-opener. And, it, and it, it made a lot of sense, it resonated with me and, uh, and I just thought, here it is, here's, here's the tool, you know, whether it's LSD or uh, later on I came to realise that other classical psychedelic drugs work in a similar way that they relax the ego and and in relaxing those constraints the mind can flower and and and, and uh, it's fuller contents um, emerge and, and arise and become visible to to consciousness <laughs>